all right, we're good. Thank you. All right, and thank you, Fernando. He's uh, one of the many champions that keeps our library running, and he's uh, helping with our hosting uh, today. So thank you, Fernando. And Gay, please introduce yourself. Uh, hello um, to all Zooming today. Um, I uh, first want to sincerely thank uh, the doctors Ernest and June Siva and uh, Pat Merkland of the Dorothy Ramon Learning Center a true jewel in the heart of Banning, downtown Banning, and uh, Francisco Ramos and Fernando Morales for making this happen from Banning Library District. Um, uh, I am a member of Friends of Banning Library. We're the nonprofit volunteer organization uh, who support uh, Banning Library. Uh, and all their good works. Um, Banning Library is 107 years old this year uh, and uh, has knowledgeable staff, uh, outstanding trustees, and spot on programs for all ages, for patrons and public alike. Um, but there's something more rare about Banning Library in that we have an historian on staff, Francisco Ramos, and that is a precious and rare uh, person in the library world now. And uh, he runs a seriously active history department. You really need to check it out. Um, and uh, uh, let's see what else, um, I think, Dorothy Ramon and uh, Banning Library for producing this historical event. And um, I really look forward to the featuring speakers and presenters, Marianne Andreas, Isabella Madrigal, and Sophia Madrigal. And thank you for being here. Thank you, Gay. This couldn't have come together without your help and influence. Thank you for everything you do for our library, for public service, for making sure that um, these programs that are so essential continue uh, with your help and the other members of the board of the uh, Friends of the Library. Thank you so much. Yes, we're a little tribe of our very own who are working for you. And uh, for those that, that may or may not know, I have another distinct honor. I have a distinct honor with working with another champion of world history, someone who has been an activist in her own way through the Dorothy Ramon Learning Center and making sure that with other groups in our area and other different constituencies in the field that we're all working together to make sure that our oral history programs continue. And she was one of the first people I reached out to that had this idea and she jumped in full force. She uh, gave me a lot of great ideas about who to invite that were dynamic, engaged speakers for this particular event. And she is a dynamo in her own way and has a long career of uh, leading the field in preservation and history for the Dorothy Remote Learning Center. Pat Merkland, thank you for all of your help. Please introduce yourself and uh, the floor is yours. Oh, okay. Well, thanks for that. Uh... <laughs> Uh, big long introduction. I didn't even know you were talking about me. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. <laughs> I'm going to introduce um, Ernest, Ernest Siva, our president of Dorothy Ramon Learning Center, and ask him to uh, start us off with a little blessing and a, a few words, and then I'll ask him to introduce our first speaker, uh, Marianne Andreas. Thank you. Ernest. <laughs> yes, Ernest, we can't, we can't hear you, but if you would please uh, kick off our ceremonies with a blessing. This is in the Serrano language. Hova art, Pukum Tamhiti, Aarati Pukum. It says to open their eyes so that they see many things, a beautiful future. And I think that's fitting in this for us today. And I'd like to say that uh, our um, 
primary speaker, the, the elder in our midst, uh, had her start with her grandma. Her grandmother did uh, carry the load of the ceremonial uh, called the Kika. And that ended when she passed in 1976. So Marianne is carrying on a, 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 in leadership and has uh, proven herself uh, through the years. When the, the times are tough, she stood up and, and told him what's what. And th those were pol political times. And um, she was recognized as, as uh, uh, championing um, tribal affairs and um, culture in particular. So we are really happy for her and for her presence today. And, and uh, young ladies, we, we are so proud of you and just keep the work up. We, we're gonna have fun following your, your careers and hakapa'ai, thank you. All right, so I guess we're ready for our first speaker then. That would be me, Pat? Yes, that's you. <laughs> okay, Marianne Andreas here. I, I would like to start off by thanking um, uh, Banning Library, um, also Dorothy Ramon Learning Center, uh, brings to mind uh, the lady that I knew, Dorothy Ramon, and her sister Catherine, and uh, uh, many, many memories of them, many years, many years that I knew them. They, I uh, would often run down to my great grandmother, Victoria Pablo's house, and they lived across the field. And uh, uh, yeah, I had a lot of good memories of them, and uh, thank Ernest for his good words about me. Uh, what I was asked to speak to today was tribal sovereignty. And um, tribal sovereignty is, is, the, is the base or the pillar of what tribes today cling to. Previous to white contact, um, we had that inherent right, that the inherent right to self-governance, to how we lived, how we managed our resources, what our laws were, and all of that. But once once we had uh, contact, then all of that, all of that changed. Our our resources were taken from us, and um, we were we were placed under the dominion, I guess, the control of the United States government. And so, uh, when in the process of taking all of our land and resources, they entered into treaties with us and said that in exchange. They would provide us, provide for us for forever. But uh, those treaties were never honored. But those treat those very treaties are the basis of tribal sovereignty, because one nation, only one nation, can enter into a treaty with another nation. So that by doing that, they recognized us as a nation, and so we were uh, brought into uh, the. United States Constitution, uh, I think it's Article 6, Section 2, where they talk about that. And uh, so that is where um, we, we have our legal standing tribal sovereignty. Uh, we consider it, I, I looked it up, I looked up the US federal definition of sovereignty, and I don't like it as much as <laughs> the tribe's version. Of course, theirs is a shared control. And um, uh, we always have believed in our own individual uh, standalone sovereignty. Uh, tribal, tribal sovereignty is the right to self-govern. And I think that part of what I want to talk about today is the importance of teaching our generations, our children, everyone, uh, even, even uh, governments, um, state government, city governments, uh, federal government um, about sovereignty and how it affects the tribe and how it came about. And uh, since governments are constantly changing due to term limits, it's, an, it's a nonstop job. About, and the importance of 
the fact that it's an inherent right, that the government did not give it to us. It was not granted to us by anybody. It's an inherent right that we had previous to, to any contact. And um, I would like uh, our tribal, we do have a tribal sovereignty class for all of our children turning 18, but I think there needs to be a greater understanding of uh, teachers uh, in, in public school, uh, colleges, and ev at every level um, that we teach the, uh, what tribal sovereignty is and how it interacts with tribes. But I think the basic responsibility is on the tribes. We have to, we have to make sure that every one of our tribal children understands that. The, the inherent right to self-governance is the right to determine our membership, the right to hunting and fishing and to create laws. And so those are all very important um, powers to have and powers to fight for. And um, over the years, they have changed somewhat, diminished, although some tribes have worked in the past to gain some back, but I think it's a constant battle. Uh, tribal sovereignty, um, I have things written down here. Uh, there's, there's different forms of tribal sovereignty. And, and I think one of the most important ones is economic sovereignty. Because when we did not have the resources, the money to hire lobbyists, to hire attorneys to, to fight battles for us, to we, for the first time during the gaming battles, we were able to muster an army of lobbyists, of public relations council, of legal counsel. And we had cell phones, we had everything, fax machines, I mean, you name it, we went to war and we won. We won to a certain degree the right to gain that we said was, was one of our inherent so sovereign rights. The general principle of sovereignty is about power and control. So in the tribe's interest, in our generation's interest, it is important that tribal leadership fight for this continuously and that our people understand it and when we we move on then they take over they stand up and they speak out and fight for the same thing the power of a of a government body to exercise both um physical well i wrote this as control over the people the land and the resources within a determined boundary. That is, that is what we have to do. In my, in my opinion, I have heard it said before, and I agree with this, and I say it all the time, the most effective protection of tribal sovereignty is the effective exercise of tribal sovereignty. That means we have to, uh, we, as in the case of gaming, we exercised our right to, so, to the sovereign right to gaming and now we have that right. And I think people in, in general, in the public, are used to it. They're so used to it, they accept that as a right of our sovereign right as a tribe, as native people. So those are those, that's one example of how we exercised our sovereign right and how through uh, determination over the years, public, public uh, council, public relations council, we have successfully generated a lot of goodwill through uh, our um, gaming operations. There are many uh, shifting policies, uh, unratified treaties um, that, that affect us constant, constantly. And uh, so then we fall back to reserved rights. Whatever is not given up in a specified treaty and is not exp explicitly spelled out, then that means that that is reserved to the tribe. And we must realize that and fight for that as well. Um, I'm hoping that uh, anything that comes out of this, and I know our um, tribal 
council. Um, all we have, you know, during this sovereignty class that we have, um, we always put tribal sovereignty as, as the very first uh, thing that we teach our children uh, because, it, because we just consider it so, so important. Um, what else was I, my point that I was gonna make? There, the three types of um, sovereignty in the United States are the United States federal government, the state federal government, and the tribes. And it is, I find it interesting that this federal state government did not sign any treaties with the state. So many people consider that tribes actually are higher than states because the federal government did sign treaties with the, with the tribes. And by, by signing those treaties with the tribes, they recognized them, each other as a sovereign. And that, that is an important point because states' rights sometimes usurps tribal sovereignty in many cases. And so that, that's another area that uh, we, we have to continue to defend. You know, in, as, as I was going through my notes and thinking about this and doing a little bit of research, I, I thought, well, it is almost as though you have to be a, like a constitutional scholar. You have to be a treaty expert. You have to be a constitutional scholar to some degree. You have to be a historical uh, scholar. You have to have a background in economics. You have to understand all of, all of what is uh, involved in tribal sovereignty, not only tribal sovereignty, but uh, the United States sovereignty, the states' rights sovereignty, and, and the tribe's sovereignty. It is uh, quite in-depth and quite uh, complex and continuously changing. You know, we have this thing called uh, pencil, pencil, um, you're moving, Pat. Uh, we have this thing called pencil uh, sovereignty where both ends of the pencil are used uh, the eraser to erase laws and the other part to to write new laws that diminish our our tribal sovereignty and I think that uh, tribes have to continue to work hard to protect our tribal sovereignty it comes down to uh, the government to government relationship it comes down to the inherent right of self-government it comes down to um, the treaties that were made between tribes as nations and the United States of America. And um, I think that uh, it, it's very, it gets very complex. It's, it's a little bit like um, a, a kid who's 17 but's getting ready to turn 18 and then you turn 18 and then you don't need any more permission from your parents to do anything and it's it's a uh, it's a little bit like that I mean we wish you know that uh, once once colonialism the colonial times passed all of the all of the food all of the resources most of the land was taken so um, tribes for many years didn't, didn't have um, money to travel to Washington, D.C., or money to hire an attorney, or money to hire a lobbyist. Many, some tribes are still like that this very day. And, um, but we, we have gained independence. We, we have shared um, knowledge and legal opinions and legal and public relations. We, have taken over control of many of the duties of governments within ourselves, like schools, uh, security, police. We elect our leaders, we take care of our land. And by doing those things, we exercise our sovereignty. The more independence and the more sovereignty that the tribes exercise, the more power that we have to protect our land and our citizens from, from the federal government. And it, it also helps our economy. We. Uh, 
I know uh, every organization that I have belonged to, the National Congress of American Indians, which is the oldest uh, Indian organization in the country, that's their number one goal. A California Nations Indian Gaming Association, that's their number one goal. First do no harm to tribal sovereignty. CASIN, Tribal Alliance of Southern Indian Nations. First do no harm to tribal sovereignty. That's the basis that we, that we can do all that we do. And so um, I, would, I would, of course, like to see more and more be able to walk up to a child and a young person and say, can you tell me what tribal sovereignty is? And have them just jump right, jump right out and, and tell me. And, um, you know, be, be knowledgeable about who we are, where we came from, and where we're going to. And um, I don't have any more. If anybody has any questions they would like to ask me, I would, I would be happy to answer. I have a question. Sure. Um, that um, last summer, I believe there was a Supreme Court decision regarding uh, treaties that had been signed in the 19th century, but had slowly eroded. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, has that had an impact? Well, I don't think the impact is yet to be felt. I know that people are quaking in their boots. I think that with the, the, the appointment of um, two Western, two Western um, judges, um, I can't think of his name, Kavanaugh, uh, was Gorsuch. one. Gorsuch, yeah. He, Gorsuch, he had come, he had worked in the West, he understood, and um, he wrote a wonderfully worded uh, decision and opinion, and uh, yeah. Yeah, that that the that has yet to be implemented. But if if well, and when it is, I think seventy five percent of Oklahoma is going to be landless and homeless, and uh, we, we will see how that turns out. <laughs> thank you. Thank Sometimes you. the law doesn't look for justice; it looks for fairness. So we will see. Okay. Sometimes right. we win and we don't win. You understand? <laughs> I do, but thank you for shedding some light on that. Yes, that Thank was that you. was everybody was so happy on that one. That was okay. a, a landmark decision. Hopefully, it, it sets precedence for more. Oh yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Okay, you're Thank welcome. You. I was told fifteen minutes, Francisco. Yes, absolutely, and okay. we also have time at the end of the program if anybody would like to. Uh, put a question into the chat or if something comes up from our other presenters and you have an idea you'd like to just, um, express either to um, Dr. Siva or to Marianne or to our presenters, um, make sure you put it in the chat as well so that we can at least get it at the end and no one forgets their question as uh, our presentations go on. And with that, it uh, looks like if you do have questions, let's save them for the end. And uh, as such, um, Pat, would you like to introduce our next speakers, please? Okay, I'm not sure um, whether Sophia or Isabella is going first. Um, I'll go ahead and go first. Okay. Um, all right. Well, then um, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Isabella Madrigal. And we first uh, really got involved in supporting uh, her um, in the year um, 2019. And um, uh, basically, um, we had had a huge storm, just just the way we had um, a storm yesterday. Only the storm we had in 2019 washed out the bridge to uh, Mayas Canyon, where Ernest and June and I live. And um, so, basically, it was just all water and everything and rocks and. So finally, uh, we decided the water was gone, and and we were crossing over this like really bumpy, rocky, rutted riverbed uh, to get out to civilization. And the phone in Ernest's um, vehicle rang and it was, um, it was your father. <laughs> and he said uh, that you were working on a Girl Scout project and he wanted to know if Dorothy Ramon Learning Center 
would do a play that you were writing. And we said, oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, we'll do that. And, um, and that's how it all began. And I always remember um, Ernest was driving and he was uh, just really, the whole vehicle was rocking back and forth and the voice was kind of fading in and out. And, and that's how we began our big adventure of uh, supporting you and your causes. And um, we've been really proud. So we're hoping that you'll share that and also um, kind of um, the qualities of leadership that you found were um, needed to help you uh, reach into your culture and, um, and share all the things that you've been sharing. Okay, so, and with, without further ado and chit chat, uh, here's Isabella Madrigal. <laughs> Thank you, Kat, for um, that introduction. And uh, yeah, I just want to start out by saying thank you um, to the Dorothy Ramon Learning Center and the library for hosting this and for inviting you know, myself and, of course, my sister to, to speak. Um, and then thank you, Ernie, for the blessing um, that we got at the beginning of this call. And, and I just want to kind of start off by saying that Yes, yeah, so what I'm going to talk a little bit about today is a Native storytelling project that started in 2019 um, with the Dorothy Ramon Learning Center and um, has since continued on in, in really exciting ways. And um, my sister and I are both continuing to carry that out. Um, but yeah, it, it did all get started in kind of the, the winter around this time, last, this time two years ago now, um, which is incredibly exciting. And um, so I'll get to share a little bit today about kind of what that looked like and um, the cultural revitalization that went into that as well as the community building. And um, just to answer one of Pat's questions, she asked kind of, you know, what makes something like that possible? And I think it really was community. And as I share, I think it'll become clear that it's not kind of a, a one person led project. Um, and there's so many people actually on the Zoom call tonight that were so integral in making this happen, who were in the play, um, and that, you know, it couldn't have happened without community support, without people willing to just be a part of that. So um, thank you to everyone uh, who's here as well um, for everything that, that they've helped with this project. So I actually do have a, a PowerPoint that I can share with you guys just to show, show some pictures of, of kind of the project to talk a little bit about that. Um, but I just, I was wondering if it's possible to screen share. Um, but if not, I can also um, just kind of talk to it. Do you have a share screen at the bottom of your screen? I do. It says that the host has disabled participant screen sharing right now. Okay. Oh, we'll fix that. Let's um, give that a moment. Okay, great. All right, there we go. I think hopefully that should be. Oh, um, for some reason it's telling me that I think it, it has something to do with my computer that I can't share it. Um, Sophia, is there any way you can share it on your end? Um, yeah, yes, let me uh, try. Did you share the PowerPoint with me? Yeah, it's the November one. Um, I think it's just something with my computer. Um, while she's getting that set up, I can just kind of uh, start talking about it and then share that at the end. Um, so 
Anyway, yeah, so Miyahue Nanentu Isabella Magiga, like I said before. Um, so I, just to kind of give a little premises for what we're going to be talking about today, um, the Native Storytelling Project that I've been talking about that's continuing in different forms is, is about um, reclaiming kind of the narrative surrounding the Indigenous experience. Um, and so what, what Pat was talking a little, about, a little bit about earlier in regards to the play, that was um, Menule in Her Heart which uh, deals with missing and murdered indigenous women and girls um, globally, that epidemic that we're, we're still facing and have been facing for hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, so, we, you know, we were able to bring the play up and down the state of California to about eight venues over the course of these past few years um, and got to perform it to quite a bit of number, quite a number of people before we had to take a pause during the, the pandemic. Um, that started in 2020. So I play Nisun, which means heart in Kulia, um, in this rendition of the play Menuel in Her Heart, uh, who is his sister to Menuel, who is played by my younger sister Sophia in the original piece. And she's kind of left to kind of pick up the pieces of a broken life until she embarks on a journey to find her sister. And you know, where the cultural revitalization part of this project comes in is that she has to weave in and out of these ancient Kulia stories uh, that had become buried in her memory long ago and that's what really inspired these play this play was this ancient story and this idea that a lot of the young people are losing these traditional stories that have so much wisdom in them and, you know not only that is applicable to to the past but also very much the present and and even can give us some guidance about you know going into the future and so, you know, Menule in her heart, it, it tells the story of a young indigenous woman who is not taken um, like her sister, but instead she has to make that choice to stay. And um, a, a large part of why she does that is because she finds something really resonant in culture and in understanding who she is, where she came from and, you know, why her voice is important. And so kind of in light with this, um, this, uh, this Zoom we have tonight, um, it's kind of, you know, highlighting the importance of, of, of female voices and young female voices and old female voices, it's very intergenerational. Um, and also, you know, the healing that can come because of things like historical trauma and, um, you know, everything, all the hurt and the trauma in the community, how healing culture and family is, um, which is something, you know, we've always known, um, but Western science is just, is just starting to understand which is also very interesting. Um, Sophia, so if you could go to the next slide. Um, and the next one after this, I think you might have a little bit of a different PowerPoint. Okay, great. Um, so just to give kind of some statistics of, you know, why I thought this, we thought this play was so important to share now was that, um, you know, 84% of Native women will experience violence in their lifetimes right now. And, um, Indigenous women and girls, they go missing at rates that are 10 times higher than the national average and 95% of these cases go undocumented by national news media. So there's clearly a need um, in the community, uh, especially for, you know, our young women and, and girls who are going missing and, and who are, um, you know, being murdered. So it, it it's really important, I think, that, you know, this play was, was not just about um, you know, bringing these stories, and that certainly was a huge part of it, but it was also kind of geared towards theater for social justice. And, and that's why it was so important that it had to come from the community because it was um, trying to not only raise awareness uh, for this issue, but to provide healing in, in kind of that intangible way that I think that art and um, in my experience, theater uh, is able to do. So if you could go to the next slide. I think I pulled up the wrong PowerPoint. Should I switch that really quick? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, that, that's, that's great too. Um, but yeah, I can keep kind of um, talking about it. So, you know, the play that, that we put on, um, it's, it's written for, you know, we always say Jessica Mayer, Rosco, Jojo Boswell, Aisha Nightpipe, Savannah LaFontaine, Greywind, these faceless names 
of the missing and murdered. And, and it's also, you know, just as much for the, for the women, which really was, you know, what the play was about. It's also for, you know, my little cousin Maya, for my sister Sophia, my mother who was in the show, you know, all the women and, um, and the men who fight beside us, you know, performance after performance to share that story of the stolen sisters to end the silence. And so it was very much about that as well. Um, you know, and that's why it was Native Voices telling Native stories. And, it, and it's grown so much beyond just kind of that first performance we had in the Dorothy Ramon Learning Center, um, where it was raining and, you know, it was in a gathering hall and it was kind of the first time we were doing it. And, and I don't think everyone had their lines memorized and it was a, it was just starting and it was very exciting. And, and now we've done it so many times and, and we're trying to, um, you know, take the next step with it as well and, and see if we can expand it beyond the play. Um, and, and that's really exciting as well. And I think that that shows that there is a desire in the community um, and even beyond that for stories like these. And it's kind of, we're at a really amazing time to kind of bring these forward <laughs> and share them. Um, you know, with, with who we can. Um, thanks, Sophia. So yeah, so here right here is a picture of um, one of the performances, if everyone can see that. Um, and, and it's from a protest scene where we kind of have some names listed that audiences can, audience members can add to and um, they hold signs and we have the, the shirts why we wear red and um, you know, that was, that's one of the scenes that, and that's from a performance that we did in Redlands. Um, I think that was the second time we had ever performed the play in the summer of, of 2019. So, like I said, it's about our stories, our telling, and we're still speaking. So this is another um, photo of it. And as you can see, we had a cast of about 18 people. Um, and it was mostly, you know, all entirely non-actors, community members. Um, being involved in this and and that's um, I think what made it you know so unique and and such an incredible thing for for to be a part of yeah and then this is just kind of some of the list but um that right there is our playbill um so that we had um everyone involved um which was really nice and these are some some rehearsal pictures, we made masks. And what I also wanted to talk a little bit about um, on that next idea right there um, is we had this kind of talk back and survey opportunity for the audience after each performance. And um, this was, you know, not only for us to try to get some grant funding and things at the end, but also because it, I think it, it's kind of part of shifting, you know, what theater is. It's not always just entertainment. Um, or kind of a very, you know, there's a strict divide between audience and, and actors. We wanted it to be kind of a, an experience for, for both of them happening at the same time. Um, so we had one after every performance and one audience member shared something that, you know, I think particularly struck me. And it's something that native writer Leslie Marmon Silco said first, we don't heal by forgetting, we heal by remembering. Um, stories are medicine and I think you know that made it clear that that hopefully that message of hope was louder than than the voice of tragedy. Um, but making space for both of those things um, was it was super important. So kind of to talk about you know um, what the play was able to to accomplish um, outside of kind of an artistic realm, um, we were able to kind of present at it in. Uh, October of 2019 at the Girls Speak Out event hosted by the United Nations at their headquarters in New York City. Um, and it was, it was a panel of girls from all across the globe talking about issues that specifically target women um, across the world. Um, and, and so, you know, we really highlighted that violence against Indigenous girls, it's not isolated to one nation, you know, and Indigenous girls have been under attack for centuries. It's often used as a war strategy to weaken, demoralize, and eradicate indigenous populations. And the taking of our women and our girls, it's part of a larger taking, right? It's part of a taking of land, culture, language, and identity. And, and we kind of stress that, you know, the, the, that needs to change and, and global leaders have a responsibility to end that right now. And um, so here are some pictures from that event and 
And I think this kind of highlights where the stories of women are so important and, you know, why we need to listen, because it really amazes me how the community came to partake in this journey, because, but it makes sense because Menul in our heart creates an opportunity for people to speak their truth. And I think when you speak your truth, right, you become visible. Um, so that makes continuation not a question, but if, but of how. Um, you know, it's this idea that healing, it can't necessarily come from hate, but it has to come from this idea of love and resiliency. And, you know, that's really what I've taken away from this project. Um, you know, that it's worth the fight to be seen. So, um, yeah, I'll just end by kind of saying that, um, you know, in the time of the pandemic, kind of how we're trying to move forward is, um, we also in earlier last earlier last year we developed a theater for social justice curriculum that was kind of based on this process of manual in our heart um, to kind of see if we could help community uh, members create pieces of theater from tradition um, that are community centered and, and in a way that um, is is you know very straightforward and doable for people who don't have a background in the arts um, to address the issues that we're facing now. And then, um, you know, just to kind of segue into Sophia, she is going to be presenting a little bit about the work that she's done also to continue this forward through workshops, um, through reclaiming stories and, and through creating a nonprofit as well in this same idea. So thank you so much um, um, for listening and I'll hand it over to Sophia now. I think we may need to unmute Sophia Fernando if um yeah sorry I was just um getting rid of the screen sharing thing so I could get back to all of you guys um hi yeah it's great to be here uh, it's a real honor to be speaking among these ladies and um a big thanks to Ernie and Pat the Dorothy Ramon Learning Center the Banning Library um Francisco just for having me and for doing something like this that highlights indigenous women's voices i think that's so important so beyond grateful to be here um, i just want to start my uh, kind of presentation with talking about a story so the chippewa story of the moccasin wabigwan is a delicate and mighty wildflower that grows on the mountainside of the anishinaabe people my mother's people this most rare and precious flower of the north is equal in strength and in frailty so you pick any part of the moccasin while big one and the whole plant will die, yet the flower only grows from the harshest terrain imaginable. So how can a flower be both delicate and strong? And this question has long rattled inside my mind. Mia Hue, Anin, hello, Ninito Sophia Madrigal. I am an enrolled member of the Kuya Band of Indians on my father's side and am a Nishinaabe Turtle Mountain Chippewa on my mother's. Stories have always been a vital part of my life, in my family, and in my culture. I have been taught stories are strength, culture is medicine, women are leaders, and we have a responsibility to our ancestors. Our ancestors survived a great deal for us to be here, and with them our stories. Yet our stories are being forgotten, and with them our identity. Many indigenous people cannot feel the strength that resides within them because they do not hear the voices of their ancestors. If the narrative that is being told is one that begins with Columbus or colonization and ends with the Indian termination policy, you will get a very different perspective than if you begin with our creation stories and end with our activism. Indigenous stories teach us that women are powerful and beautiful sacred beings. Aki, the earth is sacred. Nimison, my older sister, is sacred. Ninga, my mother, is sacred. Ajimo, she who tells a story, is sacred. The Cheyenne saying, no people is broken until the heart of its women is on the ground. Then they are broken, then they will die. I am one of 24 Kuya grandchildren, most of whom are girls. As a Native American girl, I feel personally connected to the human rights issues addressing the safety and security of women from all forms of violence. Indigenous people from across the globe and their wisdom that honors women are being erased, their voices silenced, and their stories untold. As an indigenous girl, metaphorically and physically, we are being taken. 
we hold a responsibility to receive, preserve, and promote our stories because without them, we are lost. To address the wounds within Indigenous people, we must return to a traditional form of healing, which includes storytelling. Stories are healing, and I know this strongly. My father passed away earlier this year, and it is through story that I was able to heal, heal and stand here today strong. My father told me that the greatest loss in life is not loss itself, but who we forget when trying to erase who we are. For my own healing journey, I founded the Luke Madrigal Indigenous Storytelling Nonprofit, a tribute to my father, who is a traditional Kuya bird singer and cultural carrier. He believed in work that connected us to who we are and remembering who we are. So it is in that goal that the nonprofit was formed. The nonprofit's goal is to give healing strategies to Indigenous people dealing with universal themes of hardships around the globe. For my Girl Scout Gold Award, I developed and led an online healing through the Indigenous art of storytelling curriculum. To quote Leslie Mormon Silko, you don't have anything if you don't have stories. Survival is contingent on its ability to keep telling the story, to keep up the circulation of narrations that make up the past, the present, and the future of Native American culture. Engaging in art forms has been proven to positively impact one's moods, emotions, and have a salient impact on important psychological parameters. I led community members through an eight-week journey to find the wisdom of a traditional story by developing their own story. Wisdom gained included remembering who you are. No one is ever truly gone. Life is about transformation, bringing compassion into the fight, and having a good and happy life. I saw young Indigenous girls' artistic expression come together in strength against these adversities. In this way, I saw the ill effects of colonization overcome by strengthening cultural identity through traditional stories and giving young Indigenous girls a voice in order to heal soul wounds. I was featured at this year's United Nations Day of the Girl Girl Speak Out event representing Native Americans in the United States. And last year I watched my sister Isabella speak at the UN and she was told, you have a way of being listened to as a girl that changes when you become a woman. And this inspired me to find ways to speak now. The mainstream narrative is missing a vital piece for the indigenous experience. It is missing our stories. We must tell our stories ourselves, and we must write them for our sisters, our mothers, our aunts, and our daughters. And we cannot heal through hate, but only through love and through story. In times of COVID, like my sister was talking about, we had to move the nonprofit online. So Wildflower Indigenous Spirit is a play that I wrote that grew from a traditional Chippewa story. And it is a strengthening play that deals with a girl's journey through grief and loss and offers hope to anyone who's ever lost someone. Wildflower Indigenous Spirit is a love letter to my father, and the following poem is an expert from the play that I wrote. I have a secret that your mind now needs to know. I never left you, I watch over you as you grow. I am the whispers you hear in the wind, I am the weathered lines in the moments you have grinned. When your eyelids flutter and see slumber gone, I am the nudge that sends you galloping towards the dawn. I am the earth that molds your feet in clay. I am a reflection of all the things you say. Do not think I have left you, for it is all one big disguise. I smile upon you in each new sunrise. I was able to heal from unimaginable loss because of the power of story. This is when I understood that being an indigenous girl does not make you weak. It is the very thing that makes you strong. I found beauty and pain. I had to become vulnerable to be brave. The most authentic thing about us is our capacity to create, to overcome, to endure, to transform, to love, and to be greater than our suffering. Ben Okiri. This is when I finally understood the Chippewa legend of the Makasinwa Big One, of how it could grow from the harshest soils but stand with beauty. All of us need to remember who we are and the great capacity we hold and reach the understanding that nothing is ever truly lost. We are the Makasinwa Big Ones. Know your stories. In many ways, the most important thing I can bring to help my community as an Indigenous girl is my voice, and I will do that through storytelling. Miigwech, Achima, thank you. Well, thank you, Sophia. Thank you, Isabella and Marianne, for your powerful testimonies. Um, the stories are strength. The uh, poem is especially um, heartful and important now because we've been through as a community uh, through so much loss uh, in this really in, um, precarious time of COVID. So um, I was 
reflecting on those I've known and lost in this year. And so it's a particularly important time to hear that story. So um, as a personal thank you, thank you for sharing that uh, with us. Thank you for that work. Um, this is, it's too, all too infrequent, especially in the Western um, tradition of history, to take history from the people that create it and have dealt with it personally with their own hands, their eyes, their, their senses, and to put it into a 2D medium being the paper form which is great for posterity and it seems to you know, expand the, the uh, depths of time, but we lose the context, we lose the meaning, we lose the personal feeling that these people have imparted onto others and that keep the oral tradition alive and well from whatever perspective and story that they may wanna share at that personal time. So in creating this program and this series of her stories, um, as Sophia and Isabel have remarked, the, the female perspective, especially in the native tradition, is not, is not well broadcast in my Western media sources. So I was really great to see, uh, to see that slide and to see its impact make it to the United Nations. Because when we band together, even though we've had so many logistical obstacles in these last uh, year and a half because of COVID to meet together and share our experiences like we would do traditionally, uh, this technology has allowed us to get together and broadcast it. And despite these difficulties, create an impact and share everything that, that this community has gone through and what these girls have dealt with at their young age, all the way to the United Nations. It shows the testament and power of the oral tradition, the oral tradition that we get from our First, First Nations peoples, and that we recognize we're on First Nation people's lands and recognize that we are, we are amongst a grand, rich tradition, and we need to honor it, respect it, and listen to it whenever we can. So thank you very much for uh, imparting those words to us. Um, to Sophia and Isabel, I'm sure your schedules are quite busy. Uh, thank you for being a part of this. Marianne, I've known you for five years now. Um, I've always uh, been honored to listen to you and to especially to your um, wonderful advocacy for tribal sovereignty. Um, as an educator myself, a substitute teacher, you're right. There's a, there's a definite uh, distance in what people understand and know about tribal sovereignty. Uh, I had the pleasure of listening to Ernest Siva, Dr. Siva, many years ago, about six years ago at Monkey Museum, Sing Birds, with uh, other, uh, other folks at the uh, Agave Rose that they, they used to hold annually before COVID happened. And um, like the, the sisters play, and, and their mothers are part of the play as well. And when you see it in person, you get the full force of the feeling, the feeling that, that cannot come through on a piece of paper that can't even come through in this, in this Zoom session here. So um, if, if uh, I run to thank you for, for raising such wonderful uh, people to, to, to make sure that they get this, uh, this message out to, to all of us. So if you haven't seen their play, please do, once we can go back to uh, in-person meeting again. And uh, just as, a, as the historian of the library, thank you for continuing to enrich our community uh, with, with these stories. So just a heartfelt thanks. Uh, I know we're reaching the end of our program. We still have a few minutes. And so I know there was one question uh, that came through in the chat here. So I'm going to uh, reach back and uh, ask of it. This came from Eva. Um, Eva, I'm sorry, I don't want to uh, uh, want to misspell or mispronounce your last name. Eva Soltis, I think. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Eva, for your question. Let's get that to Marianne. Marianne, Eva had a question of, how much, have you seen much progress in your lifetime with tribal sovereignty? I think more than progress, awareness um, among the tribal leadership, among uh, uh, tribal organizations nationwide. Uh, there has been some progress. I think uh, Prop 5 and the gaming initiatives brought a lot of knowledge and uh, awareness of, of our, our right to, to game. It uh, was uh, not a uh, criminal law under, pro under public law 280. It was a civil action by the tribes. So I think it took education before there was acceptance. And so in uh, that sense, uh, yes, but I think we have a long way to go yet. Thank you for the question, Eva. Yeah, thank you so much for this whole presentation. It's been really inspiring and informative. So thank you. We had a, another question um, for the sisters as well is, are your plays recorded? Um, if, since we're not able to gather together and, and listen live, is there a way people can 
uh, access your performances digitally? Um, yeah, so for Isabella's play, Manual in Her Heart, unfortunately we don't have that film, so we'll have to kind of wait till that's in, por in, um, in person. But for my play, Wildflower Indigenous Spirit, we uh, actually filmed the whole thing. So it's in all online digital format. Some of the scenes are Zoom boxes, very few are like in person with family. Um, and, uh, but yeah, you, my mom put the um, next performance in the chat. You can also find out inf more information on our Instagram and um, website, which I can link in the chat as well. So Wildflower Indigenous Spirit is online. Yeah, and then um, there will be a, um, a kind of over Zoom a reading of the play Manil in Her Heart um, uh, later this year and probably around March. Um, what's going to be um, hosted um, uh, by George Washington University um, in DC. Um, and so uh, I will, will, of course, send on that information to the Dorothy Ramon Learning Center as well, um, if anyone is interested in, in seeing that. Very good work, ladies. I'm very proud of you. Renda, you must be very proud of your daughters. I'm sure Luke is smiling somewhere. Yes, yes, definitely, definitely. Yeah, I, I see them in, I see him in them. And I do, I do, yes. Uh, thank you. I knew Luke as a young man. In, um, I'm 75, he was much younger than me, but I worked with him at the museum in different places. He was, he was very nice. Thank you. Brenda, would you like to take a few moments and, and speak after um, uh, on, on anything you wish regarding our topics today? Um, yeah, so um, yeah, d thank you for, for hosting, you know, such an important topic, you know, women's vo Native women's voices. I think that's so incredibly important and needed for the world. And um, so thank you for doing this, I want to say, Chi Miigwech, and, uh, and, um, and just supporting the, the voices. Um, I think um, the wisdom within Native traditions, um, Native teachings, Native stories is, is more important than ever for the world today. And it's a voice that really needs to be um, heard, supported, highlighted. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for uh, raising such great examples of, of that tradition and being able to help others outside of the community learn about it and learn about this, um, of this particular topic. Um, for everybody else, um, we're going to be closing our session, but if you have questions, this would be the time to ask if uh, anything has come to mind, and you can always put in the chat too. I've uh, put my email into the chat as well. So if you have questions about the library district or up and coming programs, please check our, um, our Facebook page. And also um, as a small announcement, we're producing a lovely documentary series about interesting places and topics in the past. It's called Exploring the Past. Our first episode uh, is being produced in conjunction with the Friends of the Banning Library. And it will be covering uh, our historic Fox Theater which is on Ramsey Street. You've seen our mm. wonderful marquee. Uh, <clears throat> celebrate its 100th anniversary in uh, a few years. It's going through some hard times at the moment. So um, look for that as well. But if, uh, if you have any questions, feel free to chime in here. Or if you'd like to put them in the chat, we can um, ask our presenters. I just wanted to say, uh, uh, Francisco, to Elena, that you can contact me through Dorothy Ramon Learning Center or Francisco at any time. I'm available. I'd love to talk more with you. Thank you. All right. Well, seeing that, um, I just wanted to oh, make yes, one please. last statement. I just thought, um, so I, uh, back in the, oh gosh, 90s, I was working as a, I was working at uh, it, Indian Health at the clinic. And so I did, uh, Marianne Andreas didn't know me, but of course I knew who she was. And, <laughs> and so what an honor to, um, just to have my girls like speaking with her in this format. I just, I, I think it, they're like, wonderful. I think they're wonderful. So I just wanted to say that. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Did Faith Can I make an announcement? Yes, please. 
Hi, my name is Elena Weaver. I currently work at the Morongo Indian Health Clinic, actually. Um, so, howdy. <laughs> I've met you one time, um, Brenda, one time, and like you had introduced me to your daughter, your daughter's play on one of the meetings. Well, um, and I was very interested. That's why I was asking if it was recorded or not, because I, I unfortunately am a single mom, so I don't get to a lot of get to watch a lot of stuff. Um, so I just wanted to, because I know like I had asked my supervisor to attend this because I was really intrigued and interested in everything, but I just wanted to let you guys know who I am. My name is Elena Weaver. I am a community mental health promoter with the Community Mental Health Promotions Program with Riverside San Bernardino Indian Health. Um, what we do, we just want to reduce the stigma uh, of mental health, and um, we do free educational presentations. They're 45 to 60 minutes long. We do have an upcoming one on February 9th. I can put my email, my, um, my, I can put my email and I can also put the work phone number that where you guys would like to reach me. So that way we can give you the link but because we don't have a flyer right now. But I know it's on February 9th, mental, it's a mental health 101. It will be represented with me, um, one of the newest uh, girls that just joined our group. Her name is Jacqueline Asuna. And then we also have Maria Marrera, uh, Ramirez. So we just wanted to let everybody know that, you know, like the signs, the symptoms, risk factors, protective factors, resources, services um, throughout Riverside and San Bernardino counties. So that uh, presentation will be held from um, 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. And I just wanted to let any, like everybody know that it, it, you, everybody's welcomed um, and see, like be able to meet people and, and know what we're, what we're offering the community right now, especially because of this whole COVID thing. Like um, we do work under behavioral health services. So we have our own little department, but, um, we just, we're, we're able to give out those free educational uh, presentations. Um, and we do do mental health, we do bipolar, schizophrenia, um, depression, anxiety, and where to go for help. So um, I wanted to thank you guys too, because I mean, you guys are amazing. <laughs> Your daughters are so amazing. Mm -hmm. And um, I just wanted to be able to note that too. And I wanna be able to, um, meet you guys in person. It sucks right now because of the whole COVID thing. We're, we're not able to meet each other and um, be able to do those things. So thank you again for having me. And I really enjoyed the presentations and the speakers. Francisco, I have one question for uh, Faith uh, Mario. Uh, Faith ahead. at CINC, are, is there any focus on uh, tribal sovereignty, on the education of the students there? On, on tribal sovereignty? Yes, um, thank you, Marianne, and thank you for um, always giving such wise words and the girls, uh, magical girls, I really appreciate uh, you sharing your journey on, you know, the arts, performing arts, and, and also the, um, the sacredness of our stories uh, for the Kuwia people, especially. So, um, but yes, we are working with uh, different uh, tribes. Uh, we want to reach out to Morongo and hopefully do a meet and greet and um, work towards developing more tribal sovereignty driven types of courses. Um, actually, Dr. Renda Dion, she's going to be one of our professors this spring term. So okay. she will be teaching. Uh -huh. And so, um, so we have um, history. So we try to incorporate a lot of our courses um, grounded in, uh, you know, in native um, in, and you know, in native roots. So a lot of our professors are, we're trying to reach out and recruit native professors who are uh, faculty who are teaching uh, from that perspective. So we've been successful. This is going, uh, we're going on our third year now at California Indian Nations College. And um, we wanna become more involved in, in help and integrate into the um, established um, forums such as Dorothy Ramon and Malki Museum and working with everyone um, in, in this area. But uh, I do appreciate that. And anybody wants any more information, I can also put my email address in the chat. And uh, yeah, we're just kicking off our spring term on Monday. <laughs> well, you guys look successful. Your attendance is growing. 
So you're getting you're getting your name out there. Thank you. Yes, we have Good quite night. a few Morongo students. They're doing yeah. great. Yes. Yes, if anybody's here from an affiliated organization or wants to make a, an announcement, please put your um, your contact information, phone number, email into the chat. We'll save the chat. We also have the emails of everybody that's uh, signed up for our program today. So uh, next week, in a few days, I'll try to get all the information from the organizations out to all the participants that are here so that we can all continue to connect with each other and uh, to remain in contact um, through distancing, but doing the best that we can. So thank you very much for that. Um, so anyways, it uh, looks like we're close to the end of our time here, but I just wanted to say thank you very much to our speakers and to the Dorothy Ramon Learning Center, uh, friends of the Banning Library. Uh, personal thanks to Fernando Morales. He keeps the library running. It would fall off its wheels if it wasn't for him. So he's a, <laughs> a great force behind a library. Please say hi okay. to him if you, you ever get to the library. You can stop now. You can stop. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he really is a hero of the library. And then uh, in closing, I'd just like to ask Dr. Siva if you'd like to um, say some final, final words before we part today. Oh, I don't think we can hear you. Might want to uh, unmute. He needs to unmute. Can't hear him. Hi, Michael Madrigal. Hi, Marianne. Thank you for your talk. Good to see you today. Not sure if we can hear you still. We'll give it a moment. Um, oh, okay. here we go. There you are. Yeah. Yes, there was reference to uh, the bird song, and and that we we do have a, a one third of those left. You hear them sing in the here in the Southland. Those are uh, tells our story, so I, I, I refer to those as being um, a good reference to, to uh, for people to investigate, um, if possible. If you don't know the language, that's that's a problem. But some of it is in Serrano language and some in Kuwia. But uh, th th that uh, story needs to be told and we're going to do something about that here at the Learning Center. Um, shortly, <laughs> that, that's, that's what I would like to say. And, and indeed, uh, uh, our stories are in the songs and the songs, um, unfortunately, um, are gone, the, the, the serious songs. Um, but that, that's the news I'd like to, to impart at this time. I, I really enjoy what uh, uh, the program today it was, was very, very informative. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Siva. If um, you haven't signed on folks to the Dorothea Ramon Learning Center's newsletter, which is edited and uh, <laughs> put together with the help of Pat Merkland, it's a great newsletter. Um, Dr. Siva gives um, different videos and, and speaks uh, Serrano in many of those. <laughs> it's a great educational experience. And so please uh, listen to those and, and view them as, as you can. Um, thank you all for participating today. This is gonna be the first of many of future uh, oral history exhibitions done online. So uh, this is our first in, in 2021. And I just wanna thank our associated partners again and our guest speakers who have made our, our day so much uh, better because of your experiences and sharing them with all of us. So uh, I wish all of you well, and we will see you all very soon on our next presentation. Thank, Thank you, you so very much. Oh, hi, Maria, I missed you. Thank you, Francisco and Fernando. <laughs> Thank you. Pat, everyone. Speak up. Bye. I don't know. We're not muted. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thank you, everyone.
All right, Francisco, I'm sorry to clarify. My kids were kind of talking. Did you want me to just end this right now, or should I just wait till everybody steps out? Uh, just wait till everybody steps out. I'm going to copy and paste um, the whole chat here. Okay. So cool. we'll, have a, we'll have a second backup in case um, Zoom doesn't allow us to save it for whatever. You just never know. I've, I've had stuff get lost before. Yeah, no, nah, yeah. Mr. Vasquez, thank you for coming and thank you for uh, adding me to your email and for your kind words. You're welcome. Nice to meet you uh, digitally. <laughs> nice to meet you. All right, I see the text document. So I think that we could make that as a successful thing, Francisco. <laughs> Absolutely. Not bad for our first one. I know, right? <laughs> it was great. Better than I could have hoped. I know, right? It was just like the last update. It was like, update! Update! <laughs> <laughs> Not now! <laughs> there's always something. And I've done a lot of these for uh, for the party, but there's always something that happens. You just never know. <laughs> All right, Matt. We'll let you go. All right. Thanks a lot.